just for your prayers uh, over the last week or so. Some of you, most of you probably know we had COVID uh, last two Wednesdays ago. And um, yeah, we're feeling a lot better. So thank you again for uh, your prayers and various forms of support. Um, so this morning we uh, continue on uh, in our series uh, on spiritual warfare. Uh, and we are continuing just to dig into what is one of the most well-known passages when it comes to the subject of spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20. Uh, we've been in this series over the last few weeks. Uh, and through our time together, I hope, if you have been able to connect, either in person or watching online, that you're more and more recognizing the battle that we face every single day. Um, every day we face spiritual opposition. The battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not what you see. The battle is not against the person sitting beside you or the person who's opposed to you. Uh, in whatever way they might oppose you. As Paul says, the battle is against the devil and his works and effects. Behind the visible, the invisible is at play, causing division, creating strife. And God will and pushing us towards that place where we put on the full armour of God, which is what Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, 10 to 20. In every moment and in every season, God calls us to put on this full armour. And I hope we know already, both head and heart, it's a battle that we are promised, we are promised victory in. Um, through Jesus, he's the one who started our faith, he's the one who finishes our faith. And through him, we have victory. And when I say victory, I mean victory. We are victorious because of Christ. Uh, and any attack that the enemy might throw at us, we can find victory in him. Uh, we can know the victorious power of God in our lives as we submit to God and as we resist the devil. James says resist the devil. But before that, it says submit to God. Submit to God, resist the devil. This is how we overcome. This is how we experience victory. So as we have done in the first half of this series, what we're going to do is read the entire passage. And from there, we're going to focus in in verses 16 to 17, which is our, our subject matter today, the final three parts of the armor. So I'm reading from the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. The words are going to be up on the screen for us as well. So Paul says, starting in verse 10, Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with a readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming ar arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the Spirit, with every single prayer, with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me, that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough to speak about it as I should. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we do pray uh, that as we have just read this passage and as we now uh, focus in in verses 16 to 17 that you would speak to us, that we would be open to what you have to say, that no distraction no external attack of the enemy would come upon us in these moments of, of Bible study and application. Uh, we pray that you would speak to us and that we would be changed for your goodness and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I've said in this series, um, what we've looked at so far um, has to inform how it is we approach the verses we're going to look at today. So verses 10 to 12 sit underneath verses 13 to 15. And verses 13 to 15 are really the foundation for verses 16 to 17, uh, which is our focus. Uh, in the first week, we thought about how we have this ability, this power in Christ to overcome every single attack of the enemy through our submission to God. The promise from week one is that we really can stand in the victory that Christ has for us. And then in week two, which was a couple of weeks ago, Andrew spent time looking at three parts of the armour. The belt, the armour, sometimes known, sometime known as, as the breastplate, 
and the sandals, the belt, the armour and the sandals. And the challenge we were left with uh, from this time is that God is calling us, as we put on these items of armour, this spiritual armour, we're called to speak the truth, to live the truth and to, to believe the truth. Speak the truth, live the truth, believe the truth. Speaking the truth, living the truth and believing the truth is a surefire way to send the devil packing. It's a biblical no-brainer for us. We have to do this. We have to live a life of truth with no deception and no lies, no falsehood. This is how we find victory in Christ. And both of these sermons are foundational for what, for what we're going to look at this morning. So I would encourage you, if you've missed them, to have a listen online. Um, they're on podcast, website, YouTube. That's just a wee plug for you there. Um, so these two sermons, which cover verses 10 to 15, lead us on to verse 16 and 17. I'm just going to read verse 16 and 17 again for us this morning. In every situation, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The final three parts of the armour. We're going to spend time looking at these parts uh, together. Before we do this, I just want to highlight some important truths, some important words around the shield, helmet, and sword as a whole. Um, this may be a reminder for you. You may already know this to be true, or this may be new information for you. Whoever you are, it's important we highlight these points before we spend time looking at these particular items of armour. Um, so I want to just give you three words which act almost as a supportive role for the three parts of the armour we're going to focus on. Uh, the first word is this, responsibility. Responsibility. So before we look at these items, let's just think about this idea of responsibility. Um, I've already mentioned to you the fact that the devil is real. He's an active foe against any one of you who would claim to be a follower of Christ. I've also highlighted how the, the victory belongs to the Lord, that we can find victory. We find the victory in Christ every single time. But these truths have to be connected to the fact that you and I are responsible as well. We have an important responsibility within the battle that we face. So take our passage, for example, verses 10 to 20. And just, if you have your Bibles open, just, have a, just take a moment to look, just to scan all of the different moments where Paul highlights the importance of responsibility. It's not up on the screen for us, but if you have your Bibles, just have a look. Verse 10, uh, Paul says, and I'm, pa I'm paraphrasing here, Brother and sister, you need to be strengthened by the Lord. Verse 10. Verse 11, Brother and sister, you need to put on the full armour of God. Verse 12, Brother and sister, for our struggle, our struggle, there's a shared ownership of the fight that's before us. The fight is us with God against the devil responsibility. Verse 13, brother and sister, again, take up the full armour so that you can resist an evil day. Verse 14, brother and sister, stand. Responsibility here to stand. Verse 16, brother and sister, in every situation, you take up the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Verses 17 to 20, brother and sister, and as Andrew's just spoken about, pray. Brother and sister, pray. And again he says, pray. Three times he commands us to pray. So you cannot deny this. Huge emphasis here on our responsibility when it comes to spiritual warfare. We have a part to play when it comes to this battle that's before us. And it's not that this is it. It's not that success in the fight against the devil is exclusively down to us. It's not that we have the sole responsibility here. But there's no denying it. Your responsibility, my responsibility, play an important role. The extent to which we're open to God and to his armour within our lives is the extent to which we will find victory in Christ. The extent to which we are open to God and his armour in our lives is the extent to which we will find victory. So that's the first word. Just have that in mind as we think about these items of armour. The second word I want to highlight is advance. Advance. The story of the early church. When you look at the book of Acts, when you read the New Testament, it's a story of spiritually moving forward beyond enemy lines into enemy territory and the early church witnessing transformation upon transformation of people's lives and communities through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul had a key role to play in this early church advance. He's one of the most important figures as he led the early church 
into this new gospel movement that turned the world upside down. Paul's whole psyche was one of reaching the unreached, praying and believing that the unsaved would be saved. This is what we're trying to do in Deniston, in Ridry, in the east end of Glasgow. We're walking into unreached territories and believing that God is going to transform lives in Jesus' name. You know, Paul walked into this world that was consumed by bad news with the good news. And we in some way are echoing that. So when we read Paul's letters, we need to understand that he is on a mission. And he is also writing to churches who are on a mission as well. And the mission was one of breaking through with the gospel amongst people and places that were under the power and control of the devil. So what a challenge that is for every single one of us. Denison Baptist Church, when Paul writes these words, he does so under the assumption that the Ephesians are advancing forward with the gospel. We're not just standing there waiting to be attacked by the enemy. These words are about putting on the full armor for not for the lukewarm believer. For not for the lukewarm believer. For not for the I don't really need to be on mission kind of person. This is not what the armor is for or who the armor is for. They are for those who are fully and completely governed by the great command and the great commission out of a longing that other people might have what we have. That other people might come to experience the transformational power of Jesus Christ. This is who Paul is writing to. This is who we are as a church family as well. Paul wants us to understand that if you and I are actively and consciously stepping out in the mission that God has for each one of us, it's imperative we have to put on the full armour. The armour is offensive before it's defensive. We're attacking the devil first before he's attacking us. We often forget that. We think the devil's just turning up with a baseball bat, trying to attack us in various ways. But it's the opposite. We're attacking him. We're stepping forward. We're sharing the good news. We're breaking into new ground. And he's threatened by our attacks. The belt, the armour, the sandals, the shield, the helmet, the sword... For all weapons of offence. All weapons of offence. For weapons of defence as well. But first and foremost, primarily weapons of offence. So have a look at what Hendrickson says about the armour that Paul highlights in our passage. <clears throat> and he says this, The context does not allow this rather common interpretation. The standing of which Paul speaks is not that of a brick wall that is waiting passively, as it were, for the assault of the battering ram. The soldiers referred to here are drawn up in battle array and rushing into the fight. They are both defending themselves and attacking. It may be regarded as a trite saying, but it is true nevertheless that the best defence, or the best defence, that's American defence, the best defence is offence. I've been hanging about with TJ for too long. <laughs> the best defence is offence. All of Paul's missionary journeys may be regarded as manifestations of offensive warfare. All of Paul's missionary journeys may be regarded as manifestations of offensive warfare. Paul was invading the territory which heretofore had been the devil's own. So just be thinking about that. It's about advance as we think about the full armour. And the final word I want to highlight, it's a kind of tricky one because it's difficult to, become, to come up with one word when you need to, but the one word I'm going to use is everything. Everything. Uh, all of the armour. All of the armour. This is something we've spoken about already in this series. That the whole armour is required for you to overcome the pervasive attacks of the evil one. All of the armour. Not just five items or four items. All of it. If you were a Roman soldier and you had all of this armour laid out on a table. I think the temptation would be to focus on the shield the sword and the helmet, which is what we're looking at today. But honestly, what use are these parts without the other parts as well, what Andrew looked at? Paul says, put on the whole armour for a very simple reason. We need to put on the whole armour. That's why he says it. It's not complicated. If he says put on the full armour, we need to put on the full armour. It's a biblical no-brainer. So Denison Baptist Church, let me just encourage you and let me warn you as well. And love, do not mess with this. The devil will have you for breakfast. I don't want to scare you in any way, but he will chew you up and spit you out. Spiritual strongholds will take root in your life. 
unless you put on the full armour of God. Um, something I never really thought about until we started doing this series is the undeniable importance and power of what I'm going to describe as gospel sandals. Gospel sandals. And I know Christians love a good sandal. Um, but as Andrew highlighted last time, this is about sharing our faith. This is about speaking the truth of who God is. And there's a danger of it we think evangelism, reaching others with the good news of what Jesus has done, is solely for the extroverts amongst us. Those small number of individuals who share their faith like we're putting butter in toast. It's just so easy for them. And there's one or two I can see in this room right now who are very gifted in that area and praise God for that. Praise God you have this gift. It feels like you're walking about with perma sandals on. But I just want to remind us, these sandals are for everyone. For all the introverts, I'm part of the introvert camp, but for every single one of us, for all of us who are here who love Jesus, let me invite you to put them on. And watch what happens when you put these sandals on. Sin will become less appealing to you. The world and its ways will be less attractive to you because you're walking in faith, you're sharing the gospel. The devil will no longer have power and influence over your heart and mind. Joy will take residence in your heart. So I would just encourage you to share your faith and who you are, say what you do, how you respond to situations. Be a living example of a follower of Christ. So I say all of this in order to say, let's put on everything. Let's put on the full armour for the fight that's before us. And let me just remind you, verse 11, put on the full armour of God. Verse 13, take up the full armour of God. So what an exciting life that God has for every single one of us when we do this. Because God has promised the victory. Let me just remind you about that. We have the victory. So we can step forward into this life of excitement and joy and purpose. Uh, let these words resonate in our hearts as we think about the next three parts of the armour of God. And as we think about the shield, the helmet and the sword, <clears throat> um, I want us to focus not just on our New Testament verses, but I want us to think about these verses in light of Genesis chapter 3. Uh, and this is a really important spiritual warfare uh, passage. Every single problem in your life, every single problem in the world, every single moment of suffering and tragedy can be traced back to Genesis 3. So COVID and its constant attack on our lives, the root of all of that, Genesis chapter 3. Tensions between Russia and Ukraine, as we prayed about, the root is Genesis 3. Someone gossiping and making jokes about you behind your back, the root of that is Genesis chapter 3. The imperfections, the problems, the hardships of the world can all be traced back to the sinful actions of the first ever man and woman. There are therefore lessons to be learned from Genesis 3 about what not to do. These are lessons about what we should not do when we face the particular attacks of the evil one within our lives. And this applies to the armour that we're thinking about today. We'll see how we can apply the armour in this passage through the examples of Adam and Eve and the serpent. So let's have a look at this together. I want us to begin um, by focusing on Genesis 3 and verse 1 on the screen for us. So in verse 1 of Genesis 3, we read this. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Now what is this example but a direct attack on the faith, the faith of Adam and Eve? William Bartley describes faith in this way, complete trust in Christ. Complete trust in Christ. And Satan comes into the picture in Genesis 3 and in verse 1 he says, can you really trust God? Is God really that trustworthy? You know, the devil's a liar. All he ever does is lie. It's how he functions day to day towards both believer and unbeliever. And in Genesis 3.1, he knows exactly what he's doing here. He lies. He says, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Knowing that God never actually said that. We know God did not say that because of what we read in Genesis 2 and verses 16 and 17. And it'll be up on the screen for us. We read this. This is what God actually said. You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, 
but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. God said something very different to what Satan said that God said. God said something very different from what Satan said that God said. So understand that for Satan to attack your faith, the only way he ever does this, the only way he knows is to lie. And for his lie to be successful, for this fiery dart to get through the armor, all it takes is for you to believe the lie at the expense, at the rejection of God's word. Because it has to be one or the other. You can't believe God's word and simultaneously believe the lies of the enemy. You either believe the word of God and reject the lies of the devil, or you believe the lies of the devil and reject the word of God. It's one or the other. So Denison Baptist Church, your shield of faith is what will protect you from the devil's lies and keep you living in the word of God day after day. So there's something else to note about a shield of faith. As Paul says in verse 16 of our passage, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield that Paul had in mind, it wasn't some kind of small handheld shield. The word in the Greek is the same word used for these big, great, oblong shields which were carried around by a heavily armed warrior. And Roman soldiers carried these shields together. They acted as this impenetrable wall and they moved forward, they advanced together. The shields gave them the confidence to move forward together and to make advances in, in enemy territory. And for us as a church family, when we gather together like we're doing right now in this very moment, hopefully, God willing, we are walking in with shields of faith. And this gives us strength together. We have faith together. Faith is contagious. Fear is contagious as well. Faith is contagious. The more faith that we bring to our gatherings on a Sunday and in our missional communities and at different points throughout the week, the more and more we will grow in our faith. You know, I think of a time, I think I might have mentioned this a few weeks back, but we went down to a conference. Pauline and I went down uh, a few years back and there were so many folk there who were full of faith. And we walked away from that time so encouraged, so expectant of what God might do. But I would say the same for Dennis and Baptist. As, as we go into Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening, we're often walking away from these times to use a Glasgow word, buzzing. We're absolutely buzzing from the time we've had with all of you guys because we're all bringing our faith together and it creates something powerful, something pertinent. Now the shield was normally made of two sections of wood that were glued together. And when the flame and arrow sunk into this wood, the flame was immediately extinguished. So with your shield of faith, with my shield of faith, with our shield of faith, we have a complete and unwavering trust in Christ and the devil's darts will not set our hearts and minds ablaze with doubt, with fear, with worry, with disbelief. It will not happen if we have a shield of faith, if we have complete trust in Christ day after day. When it comes to faith in God, it's not just about knowing God's word, it's about doing. James says this, faith without works is dead. Obedience to God's word is therefore absolutely essential when it comes to living a life of faith. It's not just head knowledge. We apply our faith in very practical ways. This is how we nurture and grow in our faith. What is an obedient child of God, but a child of God who has complete trust in his or her creator? A child of God whose life is marked by undeniable faith in the one who created, resurrected, and transformed them. The one who puts him first in every single moment, in every single action, in every single situation. So let me ask you this morning, how is your faith? How is your faith? To what extent are you living out on a day-to-day -day basis who you say you are? You're a child of God. Are you living that out day-to-day? -day? An obedient child of God is a child of God whose shield is up, whose shield is then breaking new ground for the kingdom of God. And as we read on in Genesis 3, we come to verses 2 and 3, which highlight Eve's response to the devil. So in verse 2, we read this. The woman said to the serpent, <clears throat> We may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it or you will die. 
as a serpent misquotes God's word to Eve, interestingly, Eve also misquotes the word of God to the serpent. Let me just highlight what God actually said. It was not exactly what Eve said that God said. So have a look at Genesis 2, verses 16 to 17 again. You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now Eve does two things here. She takes from the word of God, and she also adds to the word of God. First of all, she takes from God's word. She does not describe this tree as a tree of knowledge of good and evil. She doesn't do that. Instead, she describes it in this general, what is effectively a kind of less serious sense. She says the tree in the middle of the garden. She doesn't say the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's just this tree in the middle of the garden. And secondly, she also adds to God's word. She says that if you merely touch the fruit in the tree, then you're going to die. God never said that. Never said that. So why does she do this? Why does she both take from and add to God's word? Well, in doing both of these things, she justifies the sin that she's about to commit. By taking from God's word, she's making it easier to disobey. And by adding to God's word, she's making it more difficult to obey. So whether she does this consciously or subconsciously, we don't know. All we can say is that when we start to modify this book, whether by adding to or taking from, we immediately play into the devil's hands and we become more susceptible to his temptation in our lives. You know, a modified sword of the spirit, whether through taking from or adding to the word of God, is no sword at all. If we try and change and twist what God's word says so that it can fit our own personal agenda, it's not a sword anymore. It's just an effective weapon the devil will use against us. God's word will not be tampered with. And any attempt to do that will make you powerless against his attacks and against his schemes. The writer to the Hebrews says this, a well-known passage on God's word in this, this picture of a sword. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to divide in soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now this is actually a really powerful description of Genesis 3. Because Adam and Eve were not hidden from God's sight. When they disobeyed God, they weren't hidden from God's sight. They literally lay bare before the eyes of him whom they had to give an account. So you wonder if the writer of the Hebrews had this in mind when he wrote this passage. Their unholy lives were uncovered before a holy God and there was nowhere to run. So what Eve should have done instead was to use what God says as Jesus did in the wilderness with the devil. His word in Genesis 2, she should have used forcefully as a weapon against the serpent. She should have said something like this, no serpent, God said we may eat the fruit of, from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said you must not eat it or you will die. Now get away from here. She should have said something like that. In this way, she would not be modifying God's word to justify our sinful actions. Instead, she would just simply be repeating what God's word said exactly. His word would have been a sword for her in that moment to strike directly the heart of the lies of the evil one. And this would have enabled her and Adam to continue walking in closeness and nearness to the God who created her and loved her. Let me just remind you again what Paul says in verse 17. He says, take the sword of the Spirit. Take it, which is the word of God. What does this look like for you and me on a practical level? To take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Well, I'm indebted to a pastor and writer called Craig Rochelle. In particular, his book, Winning the War in Your Mind. This is a book I recommended on our WhatsApp group. The subtitle I find really helpful as well. Sometimes you just get a lot from a title and subtitle. But the subtitle is, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. 
And a warning for you, this book is a wee bit cheesy. Um, maybe corny's the right word. Let me just invite you to, to let the cheese pass you by. Just put it on a side plate because there's so much use. Uh, there's so much you can learn from what it is Craig Grishel has to say as he thinks about this subject of spiritual warfare and what it means to carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What he's getting at is absolute gold. Some really important practical biblical truths. And one of the key things that he recommends is for you and I to do something that Eve does not do. He invites us to pick up our sword and he invites us to use it as a weapon against every single lie and temptation and attack of the evil one. And the reality is, this is the only weapon you have alongside all the other items of armor. But these are the only weapons we have against the attack of the devil. And I'm just going to highlight six steps. I've kind of modified this a wee bit from his book. Um, it's okay to modify this because it's not the word of God. But I've modified this and it gives us a helpful picture of what it means to fight the good fight against the attack of the enemy. And the first step is this. The first step towards doing this is to identify your sinful behavior. Identify your sinful behavior. So let me just ask you, what are you doing on a regular basis that's sinful? What are you doing on a regular basis that's sinful, that's contrary to God and his word? And the second step is to then identify the lie behind the behavior. You know, what you are believing about yourself, about God and about the world around you, that you know is contrary to God and his word and is then causing you to respond in this particular sinful way. And this is what happens. Our, our sins are rooted in lies that we have believed about ourselves, about the world, about other people within our lives. Every action is rooted in either a lie or a truth. And just to make it really clear to you this morning, these two steps here are the opposite of Genesis 3. Adam and Eve's actions were sinful, but they were sinful actions that were rooted in the lie of the serpent. A lie which was contrary to God and his word. So what we're doing here is the opposite of the first man and woman in the garden. So that's the second step. Identify the lie behind your behavior. And the third step, re replace this lie with what God's word actually says. So easy for us to assume the word of God and think we know what it says. But do you ever just take a moment to read God's word and then compare that to your own, all the lies you might believe and the actions which are really a display of that particular lie. So when I gave you the example last year, just over a year ago, I experienced this kind of personal crisis of confidence. You know, I felt I couldn't function as a pastor. I could not do what I believed God was calling me to do. So what I, would, what I did in that moment throughout that season was to replace that lie with a verse or with verses of scripture. In a very practical way, I did that. And the key verse for me in that season was Philippians 4 and verse 13. Paul says this in Philippians 4, 13, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. A preferred translation for myself is this one. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ. So I believe this lie. Can't do it. Can't do it. No, no, no. It's a lie. God's word says, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things. All things through Christ who strengthens me. The lie is replaced by the word of God and it leads us on to our fourth step. The declaration. Declare your rejection of this lie and your embracing of this biblical truth. So for example... For each one of us here this morning, you could say something like this. I reject the lie that. And this is where you get really particular. Write out the lie in detail. Don't just have this vague, general lie. What is it exactly you're believing which is not true? Write it out in detail. So important. What lie are you believing? Put it down in all of its detail. So you reject the lie. And I embrace the truth that in Christ, I have the power to do all things. For he is the one who strengthens me in the power of his Holy Spirit living within me. So write it down. And then declare it. And this leads us 
uh, on to the fifth step, sorry, the fifth step is, is write it down. So declare it, step four, and then step five, write it down. Write the lie, so write the lie, write the verse, and then write the declaration. Put it in a journal, put it up on your wall so you see it constantly. Something happens in your heart and in your mind when you put biblical truth to paper and you declare it in your own words. It starts to get really real. Things start to change in your heart and mind. And once you've done that, the final step, the sixth step, speak it out. And this might be a bit weird for you. You might want to just find a, a moment by yourself to then speak this out. Declare it in the morning. Declare it in the afternoon. Declare it in the evening. The more and more you speak this out, you're rejecting the, the demonic lie. You're declaring the biblical truth through writing it out, through speaking it out the more and more you'll start to believe what God's word actually says, the more and more you will then live in light of God's word. Groeschel has a really helpful phrase to help us as we seek to let the word of God dwell in us richly. And I've got it up here for us. It says, write it, think it, confess it until you believe it. Write it, think it, confess it until you believe it. Write it, think it, confess it until you believe it. The difference that God's word will make to your life as you permit scripture to dwell in your hearts at the expense of every single lie, at the rejection of every single lie, the difference is undeniable. And I, I'm a living example of this. You know, I, I know how I felt. It was like an impossible wall before me back in December, just over a year ago. And I, I experienced God's grace, I experience freedom. So do not do as Eve does. Instead, use the word of God as your sword of the spirit, day after day, in all of these ways, through these six steps. And this leads us on to the final piece of armor. When we see this in verses 4 to 6 of Genesis 3, we read the serpent's response to Eve. Um, so the serpent says this, No, you will certainly not die. The serpent said to the woman, In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Satan's invitation here is for Adam and Eve to dethrone God in their lives so that they might become masters of their own destiny, which we do. And it's an offer that Satan presents to each one of us every single day. The deception of Genesis 3, the deception that we are presented with every day is that we do not need to find our salvation in God. We can find salvation in ourselves or in something else apart from God. And this applies to those of us who would say that we're saved, those of us who would recognize that we're followers of Christ. This is a daily problem for us, is it not? Do we not recognize this? How often do you find yourself living for something apart from outside of God's plan and purpose for your life? Make no mistake, you living for something else, it might be a good thing that God has given to you. It might be your job. It might be family. It might be a hobby, an interest. It might be something that God has blessed you with. We can all make these things ultimate in our lives. So that effectively they become our salvation. And in doing that, we're not putting on the helmet of salvation. He is not ultimate in our lives. He is not our greatest satisfaction and joy. So just identify what are the things that have become ultimate, most important. And let me just encourage you to think about the fact that it might not be a sinful thing. It might be a good thing that we've turned into a God thing. So when Paul speaks of a helmet of salvation, he wants us to understand the importance <clears throat> of remembering what we have in Christ. No matter how good something is to us, no matter how blessed it might be, it can never be as good as Jesus. It can never be as good as Jesus. That the blessing of having Jesus, the gift of Jesus in our lives is undisputed. Let me invite you this morning to again put on this helmet of salvation. Take stock of what you have in Christ. It's one of the primary weapons we have against the ongoing attack of the evil one. And it's really that, that place of contentment. We're content 
And the reason why we're content is because of all that Christ has done for us. It's one of the clearest signs that we really do understand what God has done for us and who we are in Christ. Adam and Eve effectively said, God is not enough. I need this other thing. When we put on the helmet of salvation, we're saying God is enough. God is enough. This is what it looks like to put on the helmet. And I'm conscious of the fact that maybe for some of us here this morning, some of us watching online, you've never ever done that. You've never put on the helmet of salvation. We want to invite you to respond this morning, to make that step of faith and to recognize that Jesus is Lord of your life. He is the one who lived for you, who died for you, who has given you this opportunity to respond in faith to him so that you may experience transformation. You may become a new creation. Your old life is gone, your new, your new life comes. If that's you, if you want to make that step of faith today, then do speak to myself or speak to TJ. Speak to anyone you might have confidence in. We would count it a privilege to pray with you and pray for you that you may experience the helmet of salvation. You might know what it means to live for Jesus and know what it means to have joy in your life because of all that Jesus gives to us in him. We receive all this blessing and because of this we can have, vic we can have victory within our lives. I'm also conscious of the fact that you might feel under attack this morning as well. Um, I was aware of this before we started this series but it has been pretty intense this month. There's been a lot of things including the whole kind of COVID experience. Um, but I would encourage you, if, if that's you this morning, if you're feeling overwhelmed by something, if you're feeling under attack, um, I'm aware of the fact that I'm lifting up stones in your heart and it's maybe difficult to look at what's underneath that particular stone, then, then do speak to myself or speak to someone you have confidence in. And again, we would want to pray for you through this time. But don't miss out on this opportunity to respond in prayer um, after a time of worship. The final thing I would say, this is something that Andrew alluded to as well, if, if you have a sickness or ailment, we believe in the God who can heal. Uh, and we pray and ask it in faith that, that God would heal. And so we want to just create space for folk to, to receive prayer for a particular healing uh, of sickness or ailment that you might have. Uh, and we trust that God is in control of that whole situation. So again, speak to us about that. As we respond in his ways, as we respond in worship, we invite those who love the Lord to come to this table and to come to this table recognizing that this is a tremendous opportunity for us to put on the helm of salvation as we take this bread and as we drink this cup. You're saying as you do this, as you come to this table, you're saying that Genesis 3 was a stupid idea, that the mistake of the first man and woman was wrong. And you're recognizing that we can have fullness and completeness as we put our faith and trust in Christ. And we're reminded afresh of Jesus' sacrifice for each one of us. And I'm getting really excited because Easter's just around the corner. And again, it's just this fresh reminder of all that God has done for us in Christ. And as we come to this table, just look ahead. Look, look back to what Jesus did for you, but also look ahead to all that he has planned for you. Uh, as a measure of the hope and joy that we can have as we put our faith in him. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. We take this bread, we drink this cup and we say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. So let's pray together as we respond in these various ways. So Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this time where we've been able to, to understand what your word says. And Lord, I pray that it, it would not be forgotten, that we would go from this place and that we would live in light of, of this, this word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that if there was anything of myself in that message, that, that would be forgotten. Uh, and, and all that's, that's from you, that would remain in our hearts and minds. And that you would bring about transformation. I pray that we would walk into this, this new week with gospel sandals. And with great expectation of what you might do. Help us to see that we are attacking the enemy first before he ever attacks us. And help us to believe that your plan and purpose is the very best for our lives for this particular week. Grant us faith. Give us confidence. Help us to see you in our midst. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys.